Amen. Aren't you glad he gave his life for me? And you? You too, I guess. But uh, uh, so good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's so good to be back up here this Sunday. I, uh, I got to sit back there with you and listen to my pastor preach last week, and that was wonderful. But I was still jealous because I wasn't here. So, uh, but anyway, just so thankful that we are here together again this uh, Sunday as we observe <clears throat> this holiday that we're, is coming up called Thanksgiving. Now, just to resolve uh, any any confusion, I believe the Christmas season begins December one, and Thanksgiving is just a halftime show uh, of the Thanksgiving season. So, I mean, you have a parade and everything, right? And so uh, we get to celebrate Thanksgiving and also enjoy Christmas season. Now, if you disagree with me on that, that's okay. I can't find any Bible for it anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, we do have Scripture in Psalm chapter. I'm sorry, Psalm 107 is where we'll be reading today. <clears throat> Psalm 107, verse 20. So great to be in the house of the Lord. The Bible said, the psalmist said, He sent out His word and healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love. For His wondrous works to the children of man. Verse 22. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. And tell of His deeds and songs of joy. Let us pray. Master Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together with your folks, your children, today. Thank you that we get to observe uh, this wonderful uh, season of Thanksgiving. Father, it is my mandate today that, that we observe Thanksgiving for more than just today, but that we let this season transform our hearts to a life of thanks living. Father, we pray for all those that are here. We pray for those who are not. I pray, Lord, as I deliver this sermon that you remove my fingerprints from it and you only let them hear, thus says the word of God. Father, we pray for our sister church, the Presbyterian, our, our, our family church, our community church, the Presbyterian church around the road today as they are our church of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. All right. So today, today my, my title for this sermon is From Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving. <coughs> Wordplay there. But I do have a point with what I have to say today. How many of you have ever heard of the, the saying, talk is cheap? Right? Words really cost you nothing to say them. It costs absolutely nothing, in fact. Backing up your words, now that's the hard part. Just saying I'm thankful is really not saying anything at all. Yet there are relationships that are built upon empty words. There have been jobs given to people who knew exactly what to write on their resume to be noticed by the right people, but when they receive the job, we all realize, wait a minute, they don't have a clue what they're talking about. But now is the time of the year when we tend to focus on being thankful. We focus on sharing uh, Thanksgiving with each other. And some families have this wonderful tradition of when you gather around the table, you, you, you express something that you're thankful for. And it goes around the table and each one has their own set of things that they would like to be thankful for. And that's a wonderful tradition. But the sad reality is, is what some say in word have been said opposite in deed for the other 364 days of the year, right? Um, today I will be preaching two Thanksgiving sermons. This one is the more pastoral one, so if you want the fun one, come back tonight. All right? Anyway, but I, I do think that we need more than just a one-day Heart of gratitude. And so today I want to look at how, how that happens. Because all of what I've said so far is true. And I would like to take this opportunity to go from this wonderful, short-lived feeling of thanksgiving to a lifestyle of thanks shared with one another. 
If we are thankful, there should be evidence of being thankful. Shakespeare once said, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Isn't that true? There have been times under my breath I have mumbled, you ungrateful little fill in the blank. Right? How many of you have given your hard-earned dollars, your you, you cooked, you slaved over the stove, you cleaned the house, and they come home, and in five minutes, it looks like a whirlwind. <laughs> Only my house? <laughs> Please, share with me. <laughs> right? Just, just in a matter of moments, it is, it is undone. It hurts when we pour out all that we have on the behalf of someone else, only to see that it seems to be in vain. I would say there is probably no sin more hurtful to God, our Heavenly Father, than the sin of ingratitude. Out of all that He has done for us, the giving of His only Son, the provision He makes for us daily, all of the times that God provided before we even knew we needed. You ever had that happen before? God had made the provision, the check was in the mail, the day that the bill come due, and you had no idea the check was even coming. That as we begin to, lead, to dig into the lifestyle change today that I want to talk about, we're going to notice real quick that as God is careful to note in His Word, living a life of thanksgiving requires that we make sacrifices. Sacrifices are where it's at. Young people, I want to issue a warning to you. If you are currently or will possibly be involved in a relationship where the other person never gives but they only take, it is not love. They do not love you, they are using you. Because love requires sacrifice. So if I were to ask you tonight or today, what is the opposite of love? I think I know some of your answers. Some of your answer is going to be what we've been programmed to say. The opposite of love is hate. No. You see, that makes love only an emotion. Love is more than emotion. Love is a choice that we make. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. Because if I don't love you, I'm going to manipulate you to get whatever it is that I want from you. And the moment that I quit getting what I want from you, I'm going to be done with you. That's not love. If I love you, however, I will go to the ends of myself to make sure that you have exactly what you need. True love is selflessness. That's what Jesus preached over and over again. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. That's what true love... True love went to a cross in spite of Christ's will and gave His life for people who spit on Him, who cursed Him, who flogged Him, who made fun of Him, and He did it anyway. Not because He wanted to. He did it because He loved us. That's what love really is. The opposite of, not, of love is not hate. It is selfishness. Psalm 107, 22, our text today tells us, And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and, and tell of His deeds in songs of joy. You may be asking yourself today, so what are these sacrifices that we are supposed to make in order to have a life of Thanksgiving. I'm glad you asked. Because that's why I'm here today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, And you come to Him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God you are chosen and precious. Isn't that beautiful? Let me say that again. And you come to Him, a living stone, rejected by men. Some have rejected you. But what is God's sight of you? In God's sight... You are chosen and precious. Now, I know your mama told you that. But not everybody loves you like your mama does. Okay? I hate to break it to you. But that's just the truth. But to God, He loves you better than your mama. 
He says you're chosen and precious. You yourself, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever seen a Baptist priest before? If not, look at your neighbor. The Bible just said you're a priest. You're a priesthood. Now, I, I might not like step into my collar on Monday morning. I'm back into mine, right? But we're all Baptist priests. We're all a priesthood. That's why we believe we're congregationally led. We've been talking about this on Wednesday nights. If you can't make it to that, those are pretty good meetings, even if I say so myself. But those are, we're talking about how God views every one of us. It's not Aaron and the priesthood anymore. You, you don't need me to talk to God. I'm happy to talk to God for you. But brother, sister, you can go to God for yourself. That's exciting. Because sometimes I might forget. But God doesn't. You don't. Your need is real. Take it to God. He hears you. So, if you, you Baptist priest here, if you look at uh, around, you see that all of us are. We're, we, we not only are priests, but the Bible tells us, 1 Peter tells us, that we are called and instructed to make sacrifices. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you five spiritual sacrifices that we are supposed to be intentional about. And if we are intentional about these sacrifices, you will be able to live a life of thanks living. Number one, the Bible tells us that we are to present our person to God. You know God wants you? Some of you have seen Uncle Sam pointing his finger at you. Guess what? God wants you even more. Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All of Romans up to Romans chapter 12, from Romans chapter 1 to, to chapter 12, the, but Paul is telling us about the mercies of God. He is sharing us the great lengths that God has gone to not only how terrible we were, but how God has made way for us to cover our wretchedness with his son. Then after we understand the great lengths to where God went and where he brought us from, Paul inserts this word, therefore. Right away, we notice the urgency that Paul is saying. He says he is appealing to or he is begging us to listen to him. He is begging you to hear what Paul has to say. God chose to save us by the mercies of God. Based on what God has done for us. You may ask, why should I give my body to him? Because he gave his body for you. He suffered. He bled. He died upon the cross when he did not have to. We drove those nails into his hands. We did it. We drove those nails with every nail. His heart quivered saying, I love you. Those nails were my sins and your sins. My hard heart was the hammer that drove those nails into his, the palms of Jesus. And yet he suffered and bled and died for me anyway. Aren't you thankful for that? You're in that number two. Later in the verse one, Paul is careful to mention how we are supposed to give ourselves to him. He said to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. God wants living sacrifices. So don't get me wrong. Don't go try to kill your neighbor and say, but God wants sacrifices. He wants living sacrifices. Paul is stressing that God desires us to be holy. His W H O L L Y. His. All of us. What does that look like? First, God wants us to give ourselves to Him voluntarily. I can't make you give your life to Jesus. I wish that I could. This word paints a picture of a man who willingly enlists for the army. A lifestyle of thanksgiving means that I willingly lay my life down on the altar for God. Secondly, God wants us to offer ourselves to Him completely. 
A willing sacrifice has mo no more plans of his own. A sacrifice doesn't have an opinion. A sacrifice doesn't have a will. A sacrifice will be slain. This means that we are to die to ourselves. Die to our wives, our children, our cars, our jobs, our boats, our ambitions, our dreams. They are no longer ours, but they belong to the Lord. Have you done that today? That's what God desires. Thirdly, not only does God want us to give ourselves voluntary and voluntarily and completely, He wants us permanently. We can't be His on Sunday and not on Monday. We can't be His when everything is good and not His when everything is going bad. I know there are a lot of deer hunters here in the house. Thank God for you. I enjoy that. I don't get to go. I enjoy it. How many of you, when you're cleaning that meat, the fresh piece of meat, isn't it, isn't it kind of slippery? Right? It kind of goes all over the place. And it's really bad if that slips off the fork before you get it to the grill. Right? What a tragedy. May you rest in peace. <laughs> Fresh meat is slippery. And God knew that. So even when He was ordaining the temple to be made, He thought of that. You know that God thinks of everything, even the small details? And so he commanded the priests when they built the altar for the sacrifice to be burnt on to install two flesh hooks so that when an altar, an offering is given, it can't slide away. So I want you to notice that these two flesh hooks, they are symbolic of our lives today. How many of you have ever given your life to God and then afterwards you find yourself in the same old mess God saved you from? me? How many of you have ever said, God, I'm so sorry you just forgave me of this last week and here I am again. I am him. I've been there. So God has installed two flesh hooks in our lives that is, is paramount to a life of thanksgiving. Number one, devotion. And secondly, discipline. I, I know both of those should be considered cuss words. Because they both require work. One is no substitution for another. You can't be devoted and not be disciplined. And you can't be disciplined and not be devoted. Christ wants us to be both fully devoted to Christ and disciplined to remain in Him. Aren't you glad once we're in Christ we can't not be? But our lives can waver in our devotion to Him. That is true. You can be closer today to God than you were yesterday. And you can be further from God today than you were yesterday. There is a possibility. And it's not because God moves. It's because we move. And so God says that if we want to stay fully devoted and completely His, we're going to have to allow those flesh hooks to, to get inside of us. We're going to have to be devoted and also uh, disciplined to follow Him. Some of us, we don't want those flesh hooks because we don't want to be committed. Some men won't commit to a marriage because they don't want to be tied down. Some people don't want to commit to a church because they don't want responsibility of church membership. Some people don't want uh, to serve in the church because it may cost them something. Look, Pastor, I just don't want to commit. Yet they live in a house that they have a mortgage on. They rode to church in a car that they pledged five years to pay on. And they committed it to a spouse that said, to death do they part. It's not commitment. It's devotion and discipline that we struggle with. Number two, I told you I was going to preach like a pastor today. <laughs> Second sacrifice that God wants for us is he desires our sacrifice of praise. <laughs> so God first wants our whole person devoted to him. He secondly wants and desires our praise. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 15 says through him, meaning Jesus. Then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Jesus desires our praise. Do you know that? Not just on Sunday. The Bible said that he wants them continually. He wants us sacrificing the fruit of our lips. I want to remind you that sacrifice is hard. 
It costs you something. If not, it's not a sacrifice. Singing along with everyone else on Sunday morning while everything is going well is not a sacrifice. Sacrificing is singing to God on in while you're to the top of your lungs, while you're driving the car, you're waiting to be repossessed to a home that you're hoping a notice is not taped on the door, and you're yelling out an unprovoked hallelujah. That is real praise. Now, I hope nobody's getting their car reaper of this. I'm telling you something. The financial committee may want to stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 la. God would rather have your praise than your money. He wants that too. We're going to get there. But I want you to see what the Bible said in Psalm 69. I have, a, I have actually a chapter and verse for what I just said. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify Him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. God wants us to unsolicitedly thank Him for all He has done. That's an awful bold statement for me to make. I know, considering that I'm preaching to a group of people who pay my salary. But your saying, God, thank you, is more important than the money that you give. Because if, only if, you actually mean it. Let's be careful not to miss what the psalmist means here. What he says. Do you, do you know what an ox, how much an ox was worth when he wrote that? That would be the equivalent of someone coming in here this morning and saying, God, I want to give you my Lincoln or my Cadillac. If you do, I'll meet you at the courthouse and get this done. <laughs> that was the equivalent. When they were giving God their ox or their bull, he was giving something that was extremely valuable. But God said, you can bring me the most valuable thing that you have. But if you don't mean it, it means nothing to me. Now to calm the nerves of the financial committee, I want to tell you that praise is no substitute for your material gifts. And I'll get there in just a minute. Number three, God desires a sacrifice of our prayer. To have a life of thanksgiving, not only would we need to give ourselves wholly to God, our praises to God. But we also must live a life of prayer. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before God before you. And lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice. Prayer is a sacrifice. If you don't think prayer is a sacrifice, you haven't prayed on your bad days. Because it's difficult. When things are coming in, it's great. But when the days, the well is dry, that's when it gets hard to pray. So the psalmist says there are two things about our prayer. Number one, it is like incense. Number two, it is like an evening sacrifice. Incense is a perfume. But the only way you can smell it is if it is burned. <laughs> and as a property manager, if I smell it, I know they're burning something they're not supposed to be burning. Anyway, as it burns, the perfume goes up in smoke. And the Bible said in the book of Revelation that our prayers are like lit incense of the saints. Do you realize that God bottles your tears? That's what the book of Revelation says. Isn't that sweet? That God will take your tears and the smell of the incense of your prayers delights God. He wants to hear us cry. He wants to hear us pray to Him. He wants to hear us need Him. And I say this illustration because I mean it. I, I, I've always thought, and my wife, she had to step out for just a moment, but I've always thought that however many groceries we get. It could be $150 worth of groceries, which was a lot more groceries when we got married than it is now. Amen. Amen. I used to think that I would carry every single bag in the first trip. And the reason that was is because I wanted to impress my bride. Now I've got kids for that. <laughs> Maybe because I can do it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I would carry all those bags in at one time just for her to see how strong I was and stupid. <laughs> but in doing so, I, I liked that, right? Do you realize God is the same way? He wants to see you notice Him. He wants to see you say, wow, God is good. He wants to, you to say, God, I couldn't have done this without you. 
He wants to hear you say, God, I am nothing on my own. He wants to hear that. And when you do, it goes like incense before the nostrils of God. And I want you to notice what the psalmist is doing here. The Old Testament Jews worshipped in the tabernacle. If you were going to present your sacrifice in the this way this morning when you approached the front door you would have smelled you would have seen fire and you would have seen this big altar made of brass that was called the brazen altar there was a fire in that altar that was not a man made fire this fire was started by God himself I'm going to do something I normally don't do right now I'm sweating like Mike Tyson in a spell of me <laughs> so uh, you walk in and you see this brazen altar the fire did not come from, from man. It came from God. And once you understand this, you want you to understand that Aaron, the high priest, and others, they, they didn't strike a, ma a match to light this fire. They waited on God to light the fire on that altar. It was on that altar with holy fire that animals were burned and were consumed by the fire of God. This imagery is important for us to see today because this pictures Jesus dying for our sins. That fire from heaven pictures the wrath of God and the holy wrath against God in our sin. Then when you walk past this altar this morning, you would see that there was a beautiful candelabra on the other side of that table with bread. This bread is called showbread. Only the priests would eat this bread. And this altar pictures Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. The bread pictures Jesus Christ as our substance that would feed us. And then over on the, by near the candelabra were pictures of Christ our sight. Christ our sacrifice. Christ our substance. Christ our sight. You realize that everything we have is in Jesus? Everything we need is in Jesus? Now on this golden altar in the right was right in front of the curtain behind separated the Holy of Holies. This is where the altar of incense was. As the priest would come in in the morning and in the evening, he would trim the lamps and he would go first to offer sacrifice of incense upon the golden altar. But I'm telling you all this for a reason. That fire in the golden altar was kindled by the fire from the brazen altar. It was very important that you understand this. The priest, remember you all are priests, we are all priests, always had to make certain that the fire on the altar was the fire that was in that altar and the fire on the altar was from heaven. The priest would come in with his incense, which was especially concocted by God, for God alone, and he would burn it. Now, of course, if there was no fire on the altar, there was no incense that would rise to God. If there was strange fire in that altar, then the, the Bible calls strange fire anything that was not of God. You say, Pastor, what's all of this about? You're telling me all, all, all this stuff about the temple and about uh, sacrifice. Because I need you to see this. We aim to be in the presence of God, do we not? We want to come in here and I want to tell you. The presence of God is at Parable Baptist Church. He's here right now. He has been here in this worship service. He has been here all week. And if we want to live in this, and if we want our lives to be full of this, not just one day of the year, we need to bring all this together. If the brazen altar is Christ our sacrifice, and the candlestick is Christ our sight, and the showbread is Christ our substance, and if prayer is Christ our supplication, that means that our prayer, as it ascends to God, it clears the way for us to go into the presence of God and receive Christ our satisfaction. If you're not satisfied today, if you're not living a life of satisfaction, I want you to check your prayer life. Oh, yes, amen. That's exactly what I said. Prayer is where we get to know God. It is where we meet the Lord. It is where we are satisfied. And it is the deepest longings of our heart are met through prayer. But friend, you cannot come into the Holy of Holies unless you have come to an altar of incense, which is your prayer. Number four, God desires, desires our possessions. See, I told you I'd get there. A life of thanksgiving requires 
us giving our whole selves to God. Hebrews 13, 16 said, Do not neglect to, go, to do good and to share what you have, for your sacrifices are pleasing to God. Here's another sacrifice that is pleasing to God, our possessions. God commands us to be careful not to forget to do what is right and to share what God has bestowed upon us. So today, if you want to live a life of thanks living, share what you've been given. Philippians 4, 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Listen, folks. We don't just give to the church because it needs it. We give the, to the church because you need to. Don't get me wrong. We can, sure, we can certainly use it. The more the merrier. But if all that happened to your sacrifice is as soon as it hit the plate, it burned up with holy fire, you would have still accomplished the task. You see, that's what used to happen. You bring it, you bring your finest bull. Man, that thing is pretty. And then they burn it when you get it there. I would have been offended. But if that's what happened when we come to God as you gave your, you dropped your $20 bill in there and God consumed it, you still would have gotten the same blessing as what you do right now. God is good, isn't he? I believe that. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I believe that. But the Bible tells me that. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 said, Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly. Not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. That means that we are not giving to a cause, but because someone has already given to us. Number five, finally. If you want to live a life of thanksgiving or thanksgiving, God desires our purity. Probably the my favorite psalm because I have needed it so much in my life is Psalm 51. <clears throat> you see, because I'm the greatest sinner I know. I need God more today than I needed Him yesterday. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. God wants our person. He wants our praise. He wants our prayer. He wants our possessions. And finally, He wants our purity. After David sinned with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, he knew that God would only be pleased with him if he came to him with a broken and contrite heart. You see, when we see God's holiness, then we understand our wretchedness. So today I knew as I was preparing this sermon that someone here would be coming to grasp with sin that is in your heart. Some of you, 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 you said, God, I know you want me, but there's nothing special about me. I'm, I'm covered with sin. Guess what? He covers over all that. So if you say, God, I, I know you want my praise, but I, I'm a nobody. <clears throat> Guess what? He wants your prayer more than anything. Your praise more than anybody. So, so some of you say, but, but God, I, I, I'm, I, I'm wretched. You, you don't want my possessions. You, I have nothing. That's exactly who he's looking for. Jesus was sitting by the offering plate one Sunday, on Saturday afternoon, and a woman came by and threw in just two widow's mites, which were not even enough to go down here to the dollar store and, I don't know, get something cheap. But Jesus said that was the most valuable sacrifice that day because it was all she had. Some of you say, but God doesn't want my prayer. It's exactly what he's looking for right now. And so as I close, I want to read this prayer to you. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Not according to what I can do, but according to your love and what you have done. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold your delight and truth in my inward being and you teach me wisdom in your, the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop so that I may be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones of, that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and behold and uphold me with a willing Some of you today may be broken. I want to tell you that the healer is here. Some of you may be hurting. The healer is here. Some of you may be lonely. The healer is here. Some of you may be going into this Thanksgiving and it's stirring up all kinds of memories of someone you've recently lost. This was their holiday. I want you to know that God is still here living with you. Let us pray. Master Heavenly Father, 